Hello, and thank you to all who are joining us for this webinar on the future of biological weapons threats from the perspective of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Christine Parthamore, CEO of the Council on Strategic Risks. CSR is a nonprofit, nonpartisan security policy institute devoted to anticipating, analyzing, and addressing systemic risk to security in the 21st century. Since CSR's founding, addressing biological threats has been a core focus of our work, the ongoing pandemic devastating reminder of how world-altering bio threats can be. For all of us who work on these issues, the destruction of COVID-19 and dynamics surrounding the world's responses are certainly shaping how we think about preventing future pandemics of this scale. But they're also shaping how we think about the ever-evolving character of deliberate biological weapons threats. I'm so grateful to be joined virtually today by some of our nation's leading thinkers on this topic. Max Brooks is the author of the forthcoming book and audiobook Devolution. He's also the author of World War Z, a zombie thriller that I read years ago when a Navy admiral told me it was one of the most important fiction books on international security in the 21st century. He was right, and thankfully Max has been collaborating with the security community for years on how to address biological threats. Andy Weber is a senior fellow at CSR. Before that, he dedicated much of his storied career in government to seeking to ending bioweapons programs and address deliberate and natural biological threats, including five years as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs at the Pentagon. Kicking off the discussion with Max and Andy and introducing our two, uh, two additional guests a little bit later in the day is Natasha Baj Dr. Nash Natasha Bajima. Fiction author, expert in countering weapons of mass destruction, founder of the consulting firm Nuclear Spin Cycle, and senior fellow with CSR and podcast host. Uh, I first met Natasha when we worked together at the Pentagon many years ago and can think of no one better to lead our discussion today. Natasha, over to you. Thanks so much, Christine. Um, so we're, we're doing a bit of a late night show approach here. So we're gonna kick off the discussion with Max and Andy, and then we'll get to Saskia and Alexander a little bit later. Um, if you are interested in asking the panelists of a, a question, please go to the Q&A feature. We will have 15 to 20 minutes at the end um, to cover the questions and we will pick uh, the questions that we think are best. You can actually vote for questions. If there's a question that's similar to you, upvote on it. If you have a, a sub comment, you can add that and we'll try, try to get to that as well. Um, there's also a poll, which I'm going to launch right now, a uh, two question poll, if you would be so kind um, to give your opinions, we would really love to hear from you. So we're gonna kick off uh, with uh, Max. Uh, you wrote World War Z, best-selling book about a highly infectious fictional virus that starts out in China, spreads around the world, and turns everyone into zombies. And you published this book back in 2006, but there are some extremely disturbing parallels to the current situation. You have China trying to cover up the spread of the virus, opportunists spreading disinformation, the US is acting overconfident, um, but is deeply unprepared. And even the administration is, is politicizing the event uh, in an election year. Uh, another similarity, of course, is that the outbreak was naturally occurring. And you recently wrote a piece in foreign policy called The Next Pandemic Might Not Be Natural. So my first question is this, how do you think things would be different today if the outbreak had originated from a biological weapon? And what can we learn from the current scenario to prepare for something like that? Well, I think had it been originated, my God, had, had it come from a laboratory, if there could be a trail of blame leading to a non-state actor, we would find ourselves in 9-11 uh, on steroids because if we thought we overreacted to 9-11, oh my God, what would, what, what would that mean for individual rights and liberties? What would it mean for a surveillance state? Uh, it's incalculable. And if it was a nation state, if an actual rogue state had intentionally released a biological weapon, what would prevent us from retaliating with our weapon of mass destruction, which is the nuclear option. Uh, I can't even imagine what would happen now if we could actually focus this frustration, this rage, this sense of helplessness on a target, a piece of land with actual people that we could incinerate. Uh, oh, we, would, we would be facing a, a true catastrophic scenario. 
I mean, I think what we can take from this is that there should be no difference, no daylight in between national security and public health. Because the truth is it doesn't matter whether a plague comes out of a jungle or out of a laboratory. The response is exactly the same. People get sick, they die, they continue to spread the plague. So we need to start looking at public health as a means of national security. And the good part about that is you, it's the one element of national security where you don't have to make a red or blue decision because every society has to decide where to spend their tax money. Do you put it into schools and roads and, and so-called peaceful dividends, or do you put it into weapons that protect that peace? And that, that's always the balance. But with biological security, it's the exact same thing. Every dollar that you put into hospitals, PPEs, education, public health, and let's not forget that medicine and public health are not always the same thing, but every dollar you put into that is no different than any dollar you'd be putting into the Pentagon because what keeps us healthy also keeps us safe. Andy, I'm sure you have a response to that. Yeah, I'd like to foot stomp what Max said that uh, national security equals public health. From the other perspective, the Pentagon was sometimes ambivalent. Is this, uh, is biodefense, is preventing and responding to pandemics part of its uh, mission, part of its core mission? Indeed, Secretary Esper has said that uh, supporting our response to the COVID pandemic is his third priority. So if it's his number three priority, then we're not equating national security with, uh, with combating pandemics and other biological threats. One of the most notable things that um, I, I experienced watching the pandemic was what happened with the naval ships. And I'm wondering, Max and Andy, if you would comment on you know, how you perceived that. I mean, Andy, you just said it was number three, and yet we saw naval ships kind of suffering some of the consequences of not taking this more seriously. Well, his number two priority is maintaining operational readiness, and we can see the impact of, of um, an outbreak on, uh, on readiness. I mean, it shut down an entire aircraft carrier, which is as vulnerable in many ways as a, as a cruise ship. It's like a, a giant uh, incubator or petri dish for, for biological um, infections. So um, you know, our enemies will look at that and say, oh, well, if we want to prevent the flow of forces onto our territory or let's say into South Korea uh, in a North Korean scenario, what better way to do it? To shut down ports, airports with biological weapons. It's a very effective, cheap, easy way to do it. I, and I, if I can just jump on with that, I can tell you as, as a writer, as a fiction writer, my job is to red team. My job is to think inside the head of our enemies. And I can tell you, if I was trying to get America off the world stage, this is exactly how I would do it. Because Desert Storm was the worst war we ever fought because we thought we were trying to teach the world, don't screw with us. You meet us on the battlefield, we'll destroy you. But the lesson we taught our enemies was great. Let's not meet them on the battlefield. Let's go around. And if I was looking to make America pull in, I would leapfrog right over the big green machine with a biological weapon on the home front because America's force of arms is still human beings with families back home. How are you going to keep unit cohesion, fleet cohesion, discipline, when people are worried that their loved ones are dying back in the States? They're going to want to come home. That is going to sow dissension and chaos in the ranks. And I can't be the only person thinking about that right now. Yeah, um, you know, Max, you mentioned uh, non-state actors, you know, um, and the potential that they would see in bioweapons. And, and Andy, you were in the Pentagon for many years. Are we seeing a lower barrier to entry here? Is, or is this just something um, that is still too advanced for most non-state actors? Oh, there's no question that the, the range of biological threats uh, is increasing largely because the barriers are falling. It's getting easier, cheaper, more accessible. 
uh, to our adversaries. And the technology is opening up uh, new capabilities to make even more destructive biological weapons. So this is a situation where uh, it's trending in the wrong direction. Yeah, I, I can uh, agree with that wholeheartedly because the work I did with the bio defense panel, the bipartisan bio defense panel, showed me that what would have been only within the capabilities of a government lab and millions of dollars of resources is soon going to be very much available to, uh, as, they, as they say, any crackpot with a few grand and access to the internet. Uh, we are rapidly approaching the age of democratized biological weapons. And Dr. Bajima did a, a great presentation uh, for SOCOM, which I attended, where she talked about how all you needed was a willing participant and an enabler somewhere around the world who simply had to email them the genetic code of a virus where you could grow it from scratch, or I believe you could tweak something existing and turn it into a superbug in your basement. And those days are, I don't know if they're right around the corner, if they're, are they already here? Andy, are they already here? Well, I mean, one very real recent example is the group of scientists in Alberta, Canada, who synthesized the horsepack, horsepox virus, which is a close cousin of the virus that causes smallpox. And they did it for about $100,000. It took six months. And that was two years ago. Uh, today it would probably be uh, faster and, and much cheaper. So the day is um, uh, coming when synthesizing uh, complex viruses like the variola virus is going to be something within the grasp of small groups or even individuals. Yeah, and Andy, you spent many years in the Pentagon working as the Assistant Secretary of Defense, um, preparing military forces for the potential use of biological weapons, um, also building international partner capacity for countering future bio threats. Um, I know that I've been to Kazakhstan with you and, and toured one of the labs, which I felt was a pretty, pretty unsettling, but what is one of the scariest bioweapons related moments you experienced that would better belong in a horror story by Matt? <laughs> well, um, generally, I'm, I'm not smart enough to be scared of things like this, but uh, one, one, um, one example, and you raised Kazakhstan, that you reminded me of was um, we were uh, on a secret mission to visit the Soviet Union's um, open air biological test uh, range on Vazrezhdenya Island in the Aral Sea. And the Soviet Army had abandoned it it became the Russian army in February of 1992. And we had uh, permission from the president of Kazakhstan to go visit. So we had a small team of experts, uh, one armed escort from the uh, Committee for National Security of Kazakhstan with just a, a nine millimeter Makarov. And we rented a, uh, a small uh, MI-8 uh, Soviet era helicopter and uh, left from Aras, Kazakhstan to this island in the Aral Sea, the actual laboratory and administrative and testing facilities are on the Uzbekistan side of the border. So we didn't know what we would find, whether there would be a, an Uzbekistan border guard presence. Of course, they didn't know we were uh, coming. So as we were circling this very uh, creepy looking biological weapons facility, uh, we, um, we didn't know if we would encounter people there or not. We circled a few times, decided to land. When we landed, we heard uh, dogs barking. Um, and once we got out and started walking around and there were, um, to add to the adventure, there were uh, vipers and, and many poisonous uh, snakes. The Central Asian Cobra is, uh, has a habitat there. Um, and going through these buildings that had been part of the laboratory and the support complex where the Soviet Union, about 800 of its military uh, members and scientists would conduct a, a, a biological weapons test. They put monkeys out on the test range, expose them, deliver the biological agent to them, and then take them back into the laboratories, the, the high biosafety containment laboratories to watch the onset of disease and to record the effectiveness of the disease. And these 
the whole place, it was, it reminded me at the time of uh, a scene in the Planet of the Apes. Because the Russian army had left in such a hurry, indeed, I, I believe their plan was to come back as soon as this breakup of the Soviet Union was, was reversed. Um, and life had just stopped. I mean, there were um, mess halls with trays on the tables and one storage room that had uh, about a thousand gas masks strewn all over the floor. Uh, another room that had animal cages, including a large uh, animal cage that would accommodate a human or maybe a, a large uh, non-human primate. So it was very creepy and I think it would make a good set for uh, one of uh, Max's next movies. Well, I, I, I mean, I can tell you that this is, this is the role of, of fiction, is to try to get us to imagine how these things happen. And I can tell you with fiction, you have to be very careful how you imagine it, because if you make it too real, you scare people away. You trip the ego defense mechanism. I mean, you mentioned Planet of the Apes, but that was a morality play, just like all good science fiction was. And so zombie stories are a great way to talk about plagues. Excellent. Thank you both for that. So you touched a little bit on where the world is in terms of the technological capability to conduct large-scale bioweapons attacks or programs. But what about the human incentive involved? So do you think that um, how the world is responding to COVID um, might influence if there are world leaders out there thinking about uh, sort of state-level bioweapons programs and whether they form an effective deterrent uh, or offensive capability. How do you think COVID and uh, the world's response uh, might be shaping the thinking of any leaders in those positions? We'll start Max? Oh, God, yes. I mean, you get 10, 10 government officials from any country in a room, nine of them are going to say, oh, my God, this is so terrible. We have to make sure this never happens again. But there's going to be a 10th one that says, wait a minute. This thing just shut down the world. That's a lot of power. What if we have that? We need this. I mean, you, you saw this, and I don't think this has been publicized enough. This needs to be more in the public consciousness, is Japan's biological weapons program in World War II and what they did to China. We still don't know the casualty rates. Was it a few hundred thousand? Was it a million? We still don't know. What we do know now is when that was uncovered, uh, we were shocked and horrified, but there were elements within our own government that said to these scientists, come on, come work for us. Because if the other guy's going to have it, we need it too. So yes, most definitely, you cannot have this level of power without somebody somewhere taking interest in it. Andy? We definitely have to redouble our efforts. I mean, the good news is there's so much we can do to prevent and prepare for uh, biological attacks and to deter it uh, through preparedness and good rapid response capabilities. And the Council on Strategic Risks has been uh, working on a program to um, help make bioweapons obsolete. I believe that's achievable. But I worry a lot. Uh, I agree fully with what Max said about states getting the wrong idea from watching the COVID pandemic unfold. And it's still early in this pandemic. So the damage couldn't be just uh, uh, untold uh, to all parts of the world. But even before the pandemic, the, the norms against the use of um, these types of weapons are starting to fray, to break down. We have examples, albeit with chemical weapons, both Russia, the attack in Salisbury, and the North Korean attack with VX in Kuala Lumpur, they were using prohibited chemical weapons now, those were assassination attempts or assassinations in one case, but that same capability could, be, could have been used to kill many, 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 many more people. So the, the world almost looked away at those two uses of illegal uh, chemical weapons, and I worry that the norms against biological weapons represented in the 1975 Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention are starting to, uh, to break down and erode, and that's very worrisome. There's also something very, very scary about this particular plague in that it can be masked 
as something else, as the flu, as a cold, which is one of the reasons it's spread out of control. It's not like Ebola, where if you're suddenly crashing and bleeding out, it, there's nothing else but Ebola. But this, the reason that it was so horrible, that it was misunderstood and blown off by so many leaders, was that it can hide undetected. And you cannot tell me right now that somebody uh, in Pyongyang or Dzerzhinsky Square or anywhere in this world is thinking, wow, we can assassinate somebody with something similar and they can just write it off as getting a normal disease. We were very worried. Uh, North Korea has an advanced biological weapons program. And we were very worried that they might use something that's endemic so we wouldn't be able to, to even determine if it was a natural outbreak or a deliberate attack. Right. It's much more dangerous than, than the nuclear threat because there's no way you can mask a nuclear attack or a conventional weapons attack. But a biological threat has plausible deniability. And we saw this in the 70s in Sverdlovsk when they had their biological Chernobyl. And for decades, they pretended to be Eddie Murphy and Raw going, hey, wasn't me. No, 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 it was just tainted meat. Tainted meat, wasn't me, wasn't me. And that's not going to be an isolated incident. Um, yeah, Max, how can we do a better job of conveying the p potential risk to the general public and policymakers like your work does so well? Uh, you know, I, I think that having run in national security circles for uh, going on a decade, I can see that one of the reasons we have so many problems reaching the voters is we don't have communicators anymore. We used to. During the Second World War, the government reached out to Hollywood and said, listen, we, we have all these very important policies the American people need to hear about. Can you, can you communicate them effectively in ways that the average voter and taxpayer understands? And that's critical in a republic. When I went to the biological, the biodefense panels, first big hearing on Capitol Hill, they had everybody. They had scientists, doctors, uh, intel, logisticians, but they had no one for public outreach. Nobody that was able to find a way to communicate uh, an updated version of why we fight. And, and that is so important because in a republic, in a democracy, you need the public to be on board with this. They're paying for this, they're voting for this. And if you don't make people understand you're in deep trouble, especially because we're in a critical point now in American history. We are three generations away from the naturally occurring diseases that used to kill or cripple just a huge swath of the American population, where that was part of life. And even today's elderly, most of America's elderly grew up with vaccines. There isn't the muscle memory, the gut fear of the microbe the way there used to be. So how do you not reintroduce the fear, but reintroduce the respect for the microbe? You have to do that through fiction and ways of communication and also finding not just the right message, but the right messenger because we're so fragmented. So you need to find different communities that listen to different people. You know, if I'm trying to get a community in San Francisco to wear a mask, I send probably a cast member from Transparent that says, listen, you know me, you trust me, come on, you gotta wear a mask, it's important. But if it's a rural community in Texas, I send Walker, Texas Ranger. I send Chuck Norris to say, hey, enough of that shit. You put a mask on or I'm gonna whip your ass. They listen to Chuck Norris. So finding the message and also finding the messenger. I'm in Texas, so please send me Chuck Norris. I, Andy, <laughs> um, why haven't policymakers taken this threat more seriously? Well, it's been a, an almost neglected threat. Um, there's a small group of us, both inside and inside the government and outside the government for years, for decades, who has been advocating for investing more in preparing uh, for, for this threat and, and preventing uh, biological threats. But the resources uh, just haven't been there. We, um, you know, we have this sort of episodic we, we panic, we invest after, uh, after the Amerithrax attacks in the fall of 2001. We did some, some good things. We now have a smallpox vaccine for the entire American population in our stockpile. 
but then we, we go back into complacency and, and, and take our eye off the ball. I don't know why that is. Um, we, we often would say amongst ourselves, unfortunately, it's probably going to take a major attack before we get serious about this. Well, maybe COVID-19 is in a way that attack that gets our attention, that, that uh, causes us to invest in resources and some of the new technologies that we started developing 30, 20 years ago as part of our biodefense efforts that are now uh, mature to the point where we can go from having the sequence of a novel virus to a prototype vaccine almost instantly. So we really can make this whole range of threats obsolete with that high level sustained national and global effort. So I'm going to kick things up a notch and welcome Saskia Pokescu and Alexander Titus, um, our two additional panelists. So Saskia is an infectious disease epidemiologist and infection preventionist. She focuses on hospital biopreparedness and works in a hospital in Arizona. She has a PhD in biodefense from George Mason University. Alexander Titus is a senior fellow with the Council on Strategic Risks. He's also the chief strategy officer at the Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute where he's part of a leadership team working to advance US regenerative manufacturing industry. And he's been working at the intersection of biotech, um, data science, uh, AI for, for many, many years. So Saskia and Alexander, welcome. Uh, so glad to have you here as well. And we're gonna kick off with a question uh, for you, Saskia. We're hoping that you can share your thoughts about public health preparedness from your perspective, working on the front lines to prevent the spread of disease, in your eyes, what are the major gaps in our public health preparedness that you've witnessed? What should we prioritize for the next surge of COVID-19 um, or the next bio threat in the future? Oof, there's a lot, unfortunately. And I think this experience particularly has shed light on things that we always assumed would work well, like testing capabilities. So that's obviously an aspect of it. Um, my concern is realistically when we talk about bio preparedness, there there's an underlying assumption that occurs that hospitals can handle it and they are working on preparedness and actively investing in it. And I think as we address public health preparedness and healthcare infrastructure, we have to accept that healthcare is predominantly a private industry in the United States and preparing is extremely expensive. We learned this from Ebola in 2014. So we can't just assume that hospitals have the capabilities and are continuously investing in preparedness efforts because it's just not likely, it's just not reasonable. And we definitely saw this with COVID-19 right now. You know, I, I've kind of described it as, especially in Arizona, a chaotic quietness. You know, we didn't see what New York was experiencing. And now as restrictions have lifted, we have the most cases we've ever seen. And it's a very bizarre feeling in terms of a, a quiet in the hospital. And then suddenly you have very busy teaming emergency departments and ICUs that are struggling with personal protective equipment and you know, physical environment aspects like negative pressure rooms. But ultimately, I think a bigger problem is how do we encourage preparedness in a private industry that we're expecting is investing in it? Because there's a lot of other priorities and incentives in it. And I think when we start talking about secondary surges for COVID-19, we have to see, obviously still, are we having testing issues? This is a huge piece right now. Um, I know on the healthcare side, every single day, we are reporting out on how many tests we have. It's, it's not a free for all. We can't just test everybody, although we'd like to. I mean, there are very real limitations to these even right now. And we can't just keep focusing on PPE. I've seen a lot of reports lately that say, for the next surge, we have to make sure we have enough PPE. That's not the only thing we need in healthcare. So we have to really be holistic in our approach of understanding what goes into a pandemic response in ultimately healthcare. But the underlying concern I have is, are we going to have sustained investment in public health and healthcare for biopreparedness? Because we tend to really love throwing money at these problems when they're occurring. And then when things kind of die down, the funding seems to go away. The attention to it seems to go away. And I've, I've felt this in healthcare. I mean, I think we can collectively say for public health, we simply just don't invest in it like we should. And unfortunately, we're seeing the implications of that right now. The inability to do contact tracing. You know, you have public health departments that are so overwhelmed, they can't do that. So we have to decide proactively to make investments in this and how to ensure the public health um, agencies have the resources they need, but also 
how do you prioritize and encourage private industry to prioritize um, investing in an event they might never see? You know, I always am sitting in meetings with a lot of hospital leadership and they say, well, how, you know, how long do we have to keep doing this for? Or the numbers don't look that bad. Well, we know there are some data issues that we're experiencing right now, but how do I communicate? that with hospital leadership if they don't think there's a problem. So, and that's not even touching on the disinformation and misinformation that's been really taxing for, I think, public health and healthcare response. Andy, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I think there's so much we, we need to do to be better prepared next time and, and to prevent and deter uh, the next, uh, we should never have to do this again. Let's end pandemics and biological weapons threats. I, I'm a big believer in, um, in addition to investing in public health in technology, uh, Alexander will talk more about uh, what biotechnology is bringing to this fight. We need an early warning system, like a, a, a viral weather map, so we can detect these things early and characterize them and then have rapid countermeasures as soon as we sequence the pathogen that's causing these outbreaks. And the technology is here today uh, to do that. We have uh, information sharing problems, um, artificial barriers, um, sharing information, uh, public health data in a way that can be uh, anonymized to protect privacy, but still allow us to nip these things in the bud. Indeed, if China had had a system like that, we wouldn't be um, in the situation we're in today. Great. Let's pull in Alexander to build on that. Uh, Alexander, you spent much of your career focused on developing technologies to address biological threats. Uh, are what uh, Andy describes things that are feasible? Are we getting closer? Are we getting to a point where we could have such rapid diagnostic development uh, that it changes the testing part of the equation or new technologies we can apply to the biosurveillance uh, part of the fight? Yeah, um, I really appreciate you guys uh, having me here. So I absolutely think that all of those things are feasible, theoretically feasible. They are not a something just out of one of Max's books, um, although it would be great in one of Max's books. So one of the challenges with technology is a willingness to use it as well. And I want to tie something together that Max and Andy both said. Andy said that, you know, why, you know, it doesn't really make sense why people aren't caring and really investing in this. And Max brought up the point of communicating all of this. So that's really what it is. Biodefense and these technologies that we want to use to, to do biodefense and biosecurity is someone else's problem to most people until it directly impacts their business or their mission. So over the last uh, while, up until very recently, I was the head of biotech, biotechnology modernization at the Department of Defense. And one of the things that we learned very quickly is biotechnology, no one really cared about biotechnology. What they cared about is enhancing their mission, um, you know, from a defense perspective. So one of the things that we really started doing was reframing technology and biotechnology in particular into an opportunity space. And one of the opportunities is to mitigate a lot of these biological threats. If you think if you, if advances in technology and synthesis and gene editing are creating an infinite threat space that we're really worried about, how better to mitigate an infinite threat space than to be able to respond to literally anything when, when we actually have to. So of course, we're not there yet, but those kind of investments uh, need to get along the way. And so one of the benefits of biotechnology is also a lot of the underlying advances, whether we're using it for drug development or industrial chemical processing, those same technologies can be repurposed to respond to biological threats. So instead of just investing in this technology for biodefense, you invest in this technology for the growth of GDP and economic benefit and products that we all love, um, which then get repurposed. And so we found that very quickly, the members of the Department of Defense and then the people on the Hill we were talking to, once you started saying, this is how right, Army Corps of Engineers, this is how you could start to enhance your infrastructure with biotech or Air Force. This is how you could start getting your, you know, your aircraft to fly better and more efficiently with biotech. And then people really started to get it. And then when you pull that all together um, in something like a pandemic response, then you can pull on all those technology advances. But I think one of the things that COVID has 
made very clear is one of the, it's now very obvious that a willingness to, to respond is as important as a capability to respond. Given your examples, uh, there are those who will take this overlap and some of the positive benefits of biotech in these investments and use them to further disinformation campaigns um, on the deliberate use uh, of biological weapons. Um, getting into the disinformation side of things, um, what more can we do to combat uh, false narratives that are put out by, in this case with COVID-19, by Russia, China, Iran, and others, uh, and certainly in the future when we face biological weapon threats, what more can we do to elevate experts, get the public credibly believing experts again, uh, and valuing that expertise, uh, and trying to make sure the public is well informed on the nature of whatever biological threats are emerging and combat disinformation campaigns that we already know are going to be coming next time around. Max, do you want to start? Oh, God, there's, there's so much we can do. We used to be the masters of this. The masters. We, we used to dominate the information space. Uh, but what I have seen studying this problem is a, a slow divorce starting in, even in the 1950s between the American people and those who protect them. And we've sort of, now it's complete. Now we leave it to the experts. We saw the watershed moment in uh, the September 12th speech with President Bush. Pray, hug your kids, go to the mall. That's it. We need to get back to this. We need to have a uh, thousand ideas a day of how to communicate this. I mean, I think one thing we can do right now is exactly what Twitter did with our own commander in chief. When he tweeted something out and Twitter finally took a stand and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He may not be telling the truth. So they put a warning label and they need to do that. And it, the reason they don't do it and the reason Facebook doesn't do it is simple. It costs money. You can do this. You can fact check. You can hire fact checkers. You can vet. I was at the Atlantic Council when we had someone, I'm sorry to say, from the previous administration who was trying to get a job with the social media companies. And his whole attitude, and I quote, was, hey, we're just the carton. We're not responsible for the eggs. No, that's wrong. You are responsible for vetting. So that's, that's on the protective side. But on the positive side, we can get people back. As a Gen Xer, anybody remember Schoolhouse Rock? We can do that. Listen, here it is. Here's the government plan. If we did a bill becomes a law, the biological incident annex to the response and recover federal interagency operational plans. Oh yeah, we can do this. Excellent. Uh, and we may run with that idea, we'll see. Um, Andy, do you want to build on that, including because uh, you have actually been the target of bioweapons related disinformation campaigns that are floating around on the internet. Do you want to build on that? Then we'll go to Alexander and Saskia after. Yeah, I, I've been accused of, of surrounding Russia with um, secret biological weapons laboratories in Tbilisi, Georgia, and Almaty, Kazakhstan. And it's part of a um, Russian probably GRU disinformation campaign, like they used to do in the 70s and 80s. I mean, uh, Operation Infexia, which uh, blamed HIV AIDS on the US military. Uh, we now know that it was completely fabricated by the KGB and spread through media around the world. But now the, the time it takes and the ease of access to the media without uh, any filter um, it's just much faster and easier to spread this kind of misinformation. I think the most important thing we need is uh, credible leaders. When they speak, they tell the truth and people believe it. And that used to be the case um, among our political leaders in the United States. And we've lost a lot of that credibility and it's going to take time to rebuild that. Part of it is education and outreach and having validators that people listen to uh, spread uh, the right messages and reinforce uh, the truth. So we need more Chuck Norris's and Max Brooks's uh, doing this uh, very important work for our society. Let's go to Alex. So I wanna give a perspective and I mean no offense to all of my colleagues, including myself, 
but experts are incredibly boring, right? Max Brooks writes a book about zombies and people understand how infections spread around the world, right? The government writes whatever that document he was just reading and you fall asleep while you're reading it. Or, you know, so disinformation spreads so much because it's honestly more enjoyable to read or to listen to. And so oftentimes when we're talking and trying to explain the deep expertise behind something, we lose people in the technical details because we feel like the total technical truth is what is what reigns supreme. But we've seen very clearly that 280 characters is all the amount of information you need to sow a lot of doubt. So it doesn't take a lot of words. It takes the right words. And so you need, and so this all comes back to this communication that, that Max brought up in the beginning. We need to communicate all this stuff in a way that doesn't require expertise to understand it, right? You can say they're against me, you know, I don't like them and people understand that a gut reaction, what that means. But when you say, you know, you have to stay six feet apart because otherwise the trajectory of your respiratory spray has a downward arc angle of 28.3 degrees. And people are like, can't we just say sneezes go real far? Um, so of course you, there's, there's an in-between, I'm being hyperbolic a little bit, but I think that's part of it is disinformation is honestly sometimes more fun for some people to, to consume. Um, and so we need to change that, right? If you put Brad Pitt in the middle of uh, a zombie apocalypse, boom, everyone watches that movie. So how do we get more Max Brooks and Brad Pitts in the middle of biosecurity? Askia. Yeah, there's a few things I think because I'm kind of seeing this honestly on the front lines where I spend a concerning amount of time breaking down disinformation and misinformation with my frontline healthcare workers, which is a big red flag for me. Um, and there's a few things I think communicating uncertainty is a really big piece to this. Um, people assume that anything that comes out is fact. And I think that's a very big piece we have to communicate in the beginning of an outbreak that we are kind of building that bridge as we walk across it. There will be changes in this guidance and it's gonna be a fluid evolving process. I've noticed that to be a, a very hard piece for people to understand or swallow. So you have to set that expectation in the very beginning. Um, vetting experts is a really big piece. We've seen a lot of armchair experts and when they put forth bad information and that kind of gets found out, people start to lose their faith in the people that are speaking. And I really also think helping to helping people translate the guidance that we're putting out, the information we're putting out to practice, you know, that harm reduction piece. One thing that I'm consistently finding is all of the really amazing information that experts and also the CDC push out, are, it's, it's important guidance, but how do people actually translate that to their day-to-day -day life? And that communication piece is huge because if we don't give that to them, then someone will give it to them you know, incorrectly potentially. And that's my concern. So those, those are some things I've just kind of started to see in the healthcare and public health sphere. Any other comments on disinformation before we move on to Q&A? Uh, yeah, I, I just, I just want to say that I, I think it is so, it is so critical that we need more of a fusion between the experts and the communicators. Because uh, as I said, I've seen this way too often in all these conferences I go to where I hear about all these, um, these, incredibly important complex issues. Then I go back to my hotel room and none of it's on the news. And there really is this, this distance and there needs to be more ways to partner because if you are a great scientist, a great doctor, a great thinker, you don't have to be a great communicator, but you need to know one and you need to work together and you need to find ways to get those ideas out. And, and it's not arrogance because I have seen a little bit, I've seen a little bit of snootiness and arrogance but I've also seen a little bit of intellectual incest where these, these groups are in their lane, that expression, stay in your lane. Well, everybody's so in their lane that they don't know how to talk to each other anymore. We need to start breaking down these guardrails and understanding that if you're talking to a group, they may not be your peers. So how do you get this idea out? You're not talking down, you're not stooping, uh, you're just communicating, it's that simple. Good leaders do that. FDR was brilliant at this. He communicated Lend-Lease by saying, listen, my neighbor's house catches on fire. I loan him my garden hose, he puts the fire out before the fire catches to my house. I want my hose back. Boom, done. 
Thanks so much, um, Max. So we're looking at the Q&A and there's a lot of um, bio experts um, in the audience and we're so glad to have you here and engaging in the chat. And we've seen a number of questions pertaining to the relationship between health security and national security. And one of the questions is whether the Department of Defense has unique capacities and tools that maybe civilian agencies do not. And um, so Andy, I, how about you take that question? You know, well, this is why I'm such an evangelist for the Department of Defense stepping up to uh, biological, uh, countering biological threats, because there is so much capability. Um, it's just unbelievable. And it was such a privilege to work with the biodefense community of the Department of Defense. But the ability for planning and exercising and research and development. I mean, the Department of Defense is the most incredible organization uh, the US government and indeed the world has ever had. If it puts its, puts its mind to something, it's very hard to get it to turn. But if it focuses on something, we can do incredible things. And that's why I'm tired of hearing leaders at the Department of Defense say this is CDC's problem. This is a public health problem. It's not a national security problem. Let um, CDC, NIH, let them deal with this because we need to be preparing to fight kinetic wars with our uh, adversaries, our competitors like China and Russia. We need to be investing more in nuclear weapons. Um, when I served for five and a half years as President Obama's Assistant Secretary of Defense for nuclear, chemical, and biological defense programs, I was the only senior leader with biological in my title. Half of my uh, battles were fought inside the building, protecting uh, the small uh, budgets that we put into biodefense. It was a time of sequestration and budget cuts. And I'd have to defend against joint strike fighters and aircraft carriers, which have a constituency from industry on the, the hill. And so many times I heard that same refrain, well, why is DOD doing this? We, uh, DOD built a, an advanced development and manufacturing facility for biologics, uh, for vaccines and other treatments in, um, in Florida. We had to fight like hell to get that done with leadership from President Obama and his team at the White House because it meant that we would have to stop doing something else. And so as soon as the Department of Defense makes that leadership decision that yes, biological threats are national security, it's not just about keeping our kinetic operations going in a biological environment. It's actually about countering, preventing, and responding to biological threats. Once that becomes part of the core mission of the Department of Defense, I think it will have a, a huge impact on the level of preparedness in this country. And we have to work, of course, with our partners in the other uh, civilian agencies like the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Agriculture, because there is a threat to livestock and crops. Uh, the Soviet Union had a robust program directed at, at our wheat crops and, and corn crops and our, um, our cattle industry and our swine industry. So it needs to be a, a major high level effort with leadership from the president on down. Alexander, you were also at DOD for a while. What do you uh, say to that question? Well, I just wanted to make the point that I, I completely agree with, with everything that Andy's saying. And I would say that the DOD has taken a number of steps towards that direction. So yes, there's a lot of frustration going on right now with the, the participation in the COVID response. But in 2019, early 2019, the Department of Defense said from a technology perspective, biotech is one of our top 10 priorities. Now, it still takes really where you spend your money is what your actual priorities are. But the first time ever, there is another senior leader with bio in the title 
Um, I represented that for a little while. Now there's a, a wonderful person representing that after me. So it is moving forward, um, but it's, there's a long way to go. Um, and I think that one of the other challenges is, as far as I know, there's a statutory divide between public health and intentional biological weapons um, for which, where the authorities lie within the DOD. And so that, to Max's point earlier on, it doesn't matter if it's intentional or not intentional, you respond and you develop technology to respond to that the same way. So the artificial divide in authorities there might likely doesn't make sense anymore. I just wanna add, I think that goes back all to the, the level of communication with the public. If you say to the average taxpayer, listen, every dollar you invest in kinetic weapons systems, in a joint strike fighter, in hypersonic missiles, in a Virginia class submarine, unless they actively go to war against an enemy, they're just sitting there. That's all they can do. But a biological shield can work against a natural threat as well. So you're getting an investment back in peacetime and war. That's why messaging is so important. It, as you said before, Natasha, about uh, our fleet and the dangers to our fleet. You can either wade into the details or you can say to the American public, this virus has done something that the entire Soviet Navy was never able to do, which was take a US nuclear powered supercarrier off the high seas. You phrase it like that, people will listen. Great, thanks. Um, and building what you all said, and again, some of the uniqueness and why I think communicating on this is very helpful, we should also make sure that when we're talking about defense investments and things like that, we remember DOD's own investments and how they can very often play a catalytical role in addressing biological threats. We wouldn't have an Ebola vaccine today if it weren't for the Department of Defense. Uh, South Korea, uh, our allies and partners there, I don't think, uh, or the American uh, military forces would not be as prepared for biological threats um, as they are today if our countries had not been working together for years uh, to address deliberate biological weapons threats that Andy described earlier that we're concerned about. Our forces around the world have unique exposure to disease threats, to potential deliberate biological threats. That drives really unique investments that DOD has to make for its own mission but those should always be extended to helping the American people and the civilian population around the world as well. If we stop sort of taking out these artificial divides between um, some of these things, as Alexander was talking about, there are certain laws that we have to abide and whatnot. Um, but the innovation side, you have to take the dollars that we're putting into innovating against biological threats. Those have to be a significant part of our strategy for addressing future pandemics as well. Alex? Just one more follow up on that. So a lot of the companies that are providing the most innovative uh, solutions to COVID right now were started in large part with DOD funding. So the department has been investing in this. Um, DARPA has a whole office focused on it. The Joint Program Executive Office in Chem Biodefense is there. They just started enabling biotech office. So the department is, um, and a lot, you know, a lot of the technology that we're seeing benefit today uh, are as a result of those investments. 10 years ago. Absolutely. And again, in this conversation, I hope that folks on the Hill are thinking about in the executive branch about the future beyond COVID, um, whether we're talking about pandemics or deliberate biological weapons, I hope this point um, in these, the significant gain that we get from these U.S. investments doesn't fall by the wayside in those conversations. Saskia, and then yeah, I think when we're talking about these investments too, though, we also need to look at how are they actually finding their way into the front lines in this pandemic and how is that able to be utilized long term. So we've seen in hospitals when you invest in biopreparedness for special pathogens, it actually trickles down into infection control measures that help reduce healthcare associated infections, which is a long term investment. Um, but the concern is so much of this tech we don't actually see. We have to convince people to spend money on it. So I think when we're having those conversations, you have to also consider how it's being deployed on those front lines because right now hospitals need things that, and we, we don't even know what those look like. And I have to convince hospital administrators to spend money on it. And right now we have actually let the tiered hospital approach to special pathogens expire in the United States. We have only funded 10 regional healthcare facilities for enhanced readiness in biocontainment units. 
So I think as, as we're talking about all the advancements that have been made, I'm, I'm deeply concerned that we've let a critical infrastructure just kind of decide for itself that, all right, we're gonna, we'll buy masks and that's about it. So we need to also look at sustainable PPE and um, more advanced readiness systems for screening patients and things like that, because we've had to build all of that during this pandemic. We've had to build literally into an electronic medical record system. How do you screen patients appropriately and how can we trigger alerts to make sure they're in isolation? And that's not something that should ever be done during a pandemic, but there's just simply that disconnect, I think, between a lot of the innovative technology that's coming out and then the front lines in healthcare and public health. Mm -hmm. A different type of value of death, if you will, um, that needs to be remediated. Andy, did you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I just want to um, add that in February of this year, I was told by one of the leaders of the Department of Defense Chemical and Biological Defense Program that that program was going to be prohibited from spending a dime on our COVID uh, responses. And that's a program that has been uh, nibbled away at for, for years. It, it gets cut every year. It's not a priority. It doesn't have high level advocacy. And then because of that decision, when Congress reacted in a big way with emergency appropriations for the COVID response, the department did not request any additional funding for the chemical and biological defense program. So there is a disconnect there. Uh, there's this artificial divide between regular infectious disease and a list of threat agents that I work to break down and we, we need to keep at it. It's, um, you know, there is no, as, as Alexander said, the list is infinite. There is no list of 12 threat agents anymore. That's an archaic notion. So the idea that the uh, biodefense enterprise of, a, of DOD wouldn't be allowed to invest uh, in countermeasures against something like the coronavirus or even pandemic flu, is, is ridiculous. It's like tying uh, two hands behind our back. Excellent. Um, on that note, um, we're going to pivot a little bit and ask you all to get a little bit creative here. So we have a few questions on um, suggesting that uh, maybe we should think about doing something like a Peace Corps equivalent for countering biological threats. Uh, our friend Drew Endy, who is um, we've been speaking to for years about uh, conceptually how we make bioweapons obsolete, suggested a bioforce, uh, for which I love the name. Uh, so if, if we were to create a bioforce uh, in this country or internationally, uh, what would top all of your lists in terms of what that would look like or some of the activities that it would undertake for the country or, or across the world, perhaps? Whoever would like to start. I have one you know, very timely idea. We need, a, uh, we need a Corona Corps. We need an army of people, and we have all the, the young people from the universities that have suspended uh, classes available. Um, we need an army of contact tracers so we can, we can have uh, an ability to safely uh, reopen our economy. Um, I'm sure they would love to volunteer if we would organize something like that. But without leadership, it's, it's not going to happen. And it's not going to happen. But leadership can come at, at all levels. And, and there has been some amazing self-organized uh, volunteer work along these lines. But the, uh, the government, if we had a well-coordinated federal-led response, we could be tapping into that enormous capability, just like we have with, with the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps or the FEMA Corps uh, for this uh, ongoing response. Again, it's, we're early in, it's only about the second inning of our um, COVID pandemic, so it's not too late to establish these types of, uh, of opportunities. I mean, we, I have an idea that wasn't my idea. Uh, it was actually a brilliant idea, and it was in the early stage of the Bush administration's post 9-11 response, and it was called USA Freedom Corps. And what they were proposing was to combine all of these services, uh, Citizen Corps, AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, Senior Corps, under one roof and one clearinghouse of voluntary national service. And it basically meant if you wanted to serve your country, 
there would be one place you could go to, one website, one phone call. You would tell them who you are, what your skill set, what you want to do. They would find a role for you to serve your country. And it was a brilliant idea. And then like everything else, the Iraq war happened and just sucked the oxygen out of everything. And I think it's time to resurrect that idea of voluntary, voluntary, not mandatory, because you make it mandatory, people are going to revolt. Voluntary national service, because there's a lot of unskilled jobs that need to be filled right now fighting this disease. Um, well, first of all, I mean, we have the Public Health Service, which is an amazing program that, I mean, they have come in and helped us a lot with outbreaks. And so shout out to them <laughs> in this. But I think if we're talking about a, um, a group of people, I'd also like to throw in infection prevention people from healthcare. We're made up of epidemiologists, nurses, and microbiologists. And we solve weird problems constantly. And I can tell you one piece I'm really seeing for businesses, because so much of COVID response is also economic response, is how are they taking CDC guidance and making their business safe while they reopen? I am so deeply concerned about a lot of the random companies popping up and saying they can disinfect. And if you spray this in your air, it SARS-CoV-2 won't work. Um, they don't know what the questions to ask. They don't know how to properly teach their um, you know, employees how to don and doff gloves or when you need to take off gloves. All those weird little nuances that actually have a bigger role in pandemic response because as we reopen, if these businesses don't know how to safely do it, even if we give them the guidance and then they're spending thousands of dollars on some pretty horrendous technology or scary disinfectants that really don't fall into any category, um, I really worry that those are going to be hubs for transmission and despite their best efforts to, to combat that. So infection control efforts, I, you know, obviously I'm a little biased in that, but we ho help hospitals prepare for Ebola and, and we're dealing with COVID-19 right now. So, you know, I, I think that would be a key piece to this, but ultimately epidemiologists, I mean, I know that goes without being said, but contact tracing is something that we're trained to do. I always say, if you can do foodborne illness epidemiology and you can talk to a 90 year old grandma during a salmonella outbreak about what her diarrhea was like, you can probably talk to anybody. So those are great people to have on your team because they can handle weird situations on the best of days. So we were told to get creative and there is a show coming out called Space Force. I think this week I'm so excited. And so Max, I'm curious, should we do a show on BioForce to get people energized around biotech and biology and uh, the next generation? What do you think? I don't think you need to, to do a specific show because nowadays the way media is, people go and find their specific shows that they want to watch be it NCIS or Killing Eve. So instead of concentrating under one thing, I think what you need is dispersed reinforcement in every show. And it, and it doesn't have to be big, but how many procedural shows do we have right now with doctors? Uh, more than I know about. Those need, those show runners, those writers room, that's, that's, those are my people, the writer's room. They need to be educated about the facts so they can either write one episode or just infuse the real facts into numerous episodes. That's how you get the information out there. That's the way that I think you, you have to do it is find out where people live and you go to them. Because if you were a historian, and you had nothing but pop culture to go on, and you looked at everything in pop culture in 1942 in America, you knew something called Pearl Harbor happened. But if you go to 2002, you almost did not see 9-11. You did not see it on Friends, the number one TV show in America. It never happened, and the show took place in New York. You did not see it on the top 40 pop songs. You did not see it in most movies. It never happened happened. That needs to change. What is happening to us now needs to be reflected in our pop culture. And that is the onus of that is on the experts to reach out to the entertainment makers and not tell them what to do, but make sure that if they do mention it, they get it right. That sounds like a really good program at CSR, Christine. Hint, hint. <laughs> um, so we've had a, one, one thing I've been thinking about a lot um, during the pandemic is data. 
uh, in particular location data. So I've been really obsessed with these maps that show, you know, um, how good people are being at social distancing. And there are a number of questions in the Q&A that talk about privacy, civil liberties, and addressing bio threats in a way that doesn't feel big brother. How do we do this without hindering contact tracing and disease monitoring? Um, personally, I'm, I'm old school. I like doing the phone calls and contact tracing. I think the electronic approach, there is potential in it. I have some ethical concerns, of course, especially in an emergent situation. That being said, using people's iPhones isn't going to necess necessarily tell you about the interaction they had. Um, most people who have done contact tracing or dealt with outbreaks will tell you having that human to human interaction, usually over phone, of course, with a contact will get you far more information that is especially relevant to the outbreak than any kind of um, tracking mechanism, at least that we've developed so far. So I think that is, has potential for use, but it can't override contact tracing simply because those conversations about the interaction and all these other variables we look at. I mean, I remember our list of questions used to be three or four pages that we would ask people. And so I'm, I'm very hesitant to see that because I think there are some ethical implications to it. There are far better people than me to go into those, but we can't just roll something out in the middle of a pandemic because I think that's taking advantage of the situation. So we need to be very mindful of that. And I can just jump in by saying that with the biodefense panel, one of the things we discussed is what I call finding the rabbis. Because when there was a measles outbreak in New York and some of it was in the Orthodox Jewish community, they were very wary of strangers coming into their community, telling them what to do, asking them questions. So the government of New York uh, found the rabbis. These were people that the community trusted. And so when they were asking those questions, when they were telling them what to do, they were listened to. And so once again, this goes back to what I said in the beginning about message and messenger. We need to micro-target every single community and find messengers that they trust. The same way that if I'm a baby boomer and somebody's trying to get me to do a reverse mortgage, they send me Tom Selleck because God knows how many times I've seen him on TV trying to get me to reverse mortgage. That's how you have to do it. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of brain power. Uh, but we're, this isn't the 1940s anymore. You can't just have Humphrey Bogart walk out on a stage telling you to buy a war bond and everyone listens. We're fragmented. So we need to work with that. Alexander, you're a data scientist. Um, I'm sure you've been following just all the data that we have um, at our fingertips during this particular outbreak. And I'm curious, what are your thoughts about how we use data, what, what things we need to think about um, in using data, and how we move forward? Yeah, I am um, probably on the more progressive side of thinking how we should use data. I'm a data scientist, so I live and I used to live and breathe the value of data. I completely agree that there are very much uh, very real privacy and security concerns that you want to take into place, but there are also a lot of very innovative ways to to mitigate those as well. Uh, I mean all of the differential privacy that like Apple builds into all of their information, I mean there are dating apps or hookup apps that tell you when you're within a hundred yards of someone who's looking for fun, right? There are, there are contact tracing apps for other purposes. So there are, and so this gets back to engagement and how do you engage people in the right way? How do you build the trust around sharing that data? Because we share more data. I mean, every piece of data about our life is shared right now. Um, and so it's doing it right um, in, in this context. And that gets, I think that really gets to engaging people in, I don't, I don't have the answer to how best to engage people, but similar to, a lot of what Max is saying, right, go to them in those kind of venues. Um, I think that would be a huge helpful, hugely helpful. Andy, were you going to weigh in? Yeah, I, I'd like to add that, you know, in, in my experience, it's during a war that you innovate. So now is a huge opportunity that we should be seizing. And uh, I'm on Alexander's side. I, I guess I'll call myself also progressive on this. Um, we need a, you know, a Fitbit for viruses something that people will want to have so they know day to day that they're healthy, that it's safe for their kids to go to nursery school. Um, and this also is going to be enabled. If we can get a, a, a reliable, uh, cheap, disposable saliva test that people can use 
and then have that report up through their smartphone. We can have exquisite uh, public health. We can populate a, uh, an infectious disease weather map and actually even get to the point of predicting and forecasting outbreaks. And that's where we need to be, not just within our own country, but globally. And while I served at DOD, we invested heavily in biosurveillance, but there were so many artificial barriers within the US government, CDC not wanting to share with DOD, DOD or even NIH in some cases. The same goes for sample sharing. Um, I, I still don't think the Chinese have shared uh, a sample of the um, uh, virus that causes COVID-19 um, other than posting the sequence, which was amazing that they did that and very, very useful. But we need to break down these artificial barriers uh, for data sharing and have it more, much more distributed and ubiquitous. So at the individual level that then can be used for public health purposes in an aggregate form. Thanks, Andy. And uh, several of the questions and comments actually name some of those specific artificial barriers and suggestions on this front. We really appreciate everybody's ideas uh, sharing in the Q&A. Um, back to the communications point. I mean, on this one, you're going to have to convince people that uh, just like with anything else, even if they want to know if they're getting into or avoiding a very an environment in which they could be exposed to dangerous viruses or that they're carrying one and should stay home uh, or whatever the case may be, uh, there's still gonna have to be a lot of convincing of the public to accept these technologies, even if they seem like they're inherently good and desired uh, at the individual level. So getting back to the communications point, um, one person raised the question of um, if you had to balance uh, your emphasis bring in more entertainers and people who tell stories well versus training boring experts like us, uh, like some of us here, uh, to be better communicators and make your work and your long reports more exciting and interesting. Is there one way that's more important to progress in this area than the other, or does it need to be sort of an equal, equal emphasis on both uh, sides of those? And I'll ask Natasha to weigh in on this as well. I'll pull a thread Max uh, had earlier. Um, for CSR, part of why we were founded was also to break down silos across different threat spaces. So we get nuclear threat and climate threat people talking to each other and bio threat and climate threat people talking to each other. You talked about that and its importance in communication so that we all just don't create our own little circles that we're talking to each other within. Um, so any, any further ideas on breaking down silos, even among expert communities or whoever is needed uh, to make progress in this area. And then again, if you had to vote um, every marginal dollar toward experts and getting us communicating better versus bringing in people who already know how to combination, curious on everybody's thoughts on that. You know, Natasha, remember we went to that, we were at that conference uh, in Pittsburgh and I remember sitting in one of the working groups with uh, all of our Asian allies and a special forces guy asked them, who do your people trust? Cause that's what you do first before you talk, you listen. And it was across the board. It had nothing to do with culture, geography, religion. It had to do with age. Everyone over 30 still believed in politicians, news media, traditional movie stars. Under 30, social media, YouTubers. So you have to, like I keep saying, you have to start where people live. So before we decide what to do, we have to listen to the American people. Who do you listen to? And then once we have that data, this is back to Alexander. Once we have that data of who people listen to, then we go to those people and say, listen, you gotta help us out. You gotta help keep people safe. And like I said, it could be a politician. It could be Dr. Anthony Fauci. It could be some weird Swedish YouTuber who opens boxes for a living. And he, but maybe he gets a million followers and he says, hello, today we're going to open the box Oh, look, it's a vaccine. A million people just listen to that. 
I mean, I'm I, I'm in violent agreement with Max. Um, I think one of the reasons um, I write fiction and I'm so passionate about using entertainment to educate is that, well, first and foremost, and something that I noticed working in the Department of Defense is we're not really in the 21st century there. Um, we need to be on social media. We need to be in video. Here we are, a live webinar. Um, if you're not in video on social media, you are not where people are looking, right? How many? I mean, pretty much we're not on our phones right now, but if we weren't on this webinar, we might be on our phones, right? So if you're not in somebody's feed and you're not showing this really short clip of someone being funny, saying something useful, kind of like Max, somebody that somebody trusts, then you're not gonna get your message across. But I also believe passionately, because I am an expert, in educating experts to speak and articulate complex topics with very simple language. This is not hard, but it requires something that I think Andy touched on, Max touched on. We need to get out of our silos and start talking across the aisle. We need to talk with other people. And when we talk to other people, we can't use five acronyms in a sentence because they have different acronyms, right? So I think it's a lot of everything. Um, basically, I, I know that's a non-answer, Christine, but I think we have to um, be better communicators as experts. I think we need to help educate entertainers and we have to help them understand that getting technical details right doesn't mean you're boring those can be really great complications in your narrative right that can be the turning point and um i think we need to also as max suggested we need to think about what audience are we talking to who's best positioned to talk to that audience yeah, I think one of the biggest pieces is really, you know, you mentioned audience, understanding what people are looking to get out of that communication, but I actually really like the blending of experts and then um, someone in, you know, you mentioned, Max mentioned celebrities. Believe it or not, one of the best intersections of this I've seen, Miley Cyrus had an Instagram week where she was bringing on experts and she had um, special pathogens person on there and, you know, Saira Madad, and she asked her real questions about what this truly meant. And I, I'm not even kidding you. It was some of the best um, conversation and dialogue that I'd seen getting the message across, but answering questions real time from people that in that age group that really didn't know who to talk to, or they maybe not, didn't watch, you know, the news every single day. So I think those kind of blended efforts on platforms that are being utilized can be really helpful, you know, having that celebrity or that person that's going to get in the audience and then having them interview a subject matter expert and having a conversation really goes a long ways. Um, and I'll piggyback on that by extending a personal invitation to Miley Cyrus, uh, who I love. Uh, if she ever wants to get into working on biological threats, uh, working against them with us. We would love to have her in any capacity. She's amazing. Um, I like that suggestion very much. Uh, there are several questions also. I know time is running a little short, but um, there are several questions on international cooperation. We have a biological and toxin weapons convention. We've done great international cooperation in past pandemics. Uh, what do we think about this subject? What should we do differently um, to prevent future pandemics and address bioweapons threats? differently in the future after COVID-19 uh, in terms of regaining trust and confidence in international collaboration? Well, I, I had the privilege of helping um, President Obama support our uh, response to the Ebola crisis in West Africa in 2014 and the uh, first part of 2015. And there was nothing like uh, American leadership. And President Obama stepped up and he mobilized over 70 countries around the world to contribute to that uh, global response. You know, clearly viruses don't need visas. These, uh, this is an issue like climate change that requires international cooperation work across borders. Indeed, the global health security agenda, which we created in February of 2014, uh, is a good example of that. Of, of getting that interdisciplinary and international focus on building the public health capabilities so any country can detect and respond to disease outbreaks because an outbreak anywhere is a threat everywhere. And we're learning that, but without US leadership, which is lacking right now, uh, there isn't a, a real um, coming together together 
of uh, countries around the world. In fact, we're seeing even more divisions and, and it really uh, is tragic. Yeah, so um, we have tons of questions. We can't get to all of them. Um, I did uh, have a poll here, and so I'm gonna go over the results and then put the questions to our panel. What do you think should be the top priority of companies developing advanced technologies, e.g. biotech and AI, for addressing future biological events? And tools for predicting, detecting, and tracking uh, incidents uh, ranked 66%. Um, rapid diagnostics for identifying cases of infection came in second with 46%. Proactive development of potential treatments, 19%. Proactive development of vaccines, 28%. I should just also note that 100% um, of our attendees have voted on this, so this must be the best poll ever. So I'm just <laughs> curious um, from our panel, what do you think the top priority should be in developing advanced technologies? And I'll throw that to Alexander first. Yeah, I think that that's a... I think that's very challenging to answer, but uh, my benefit or my perspective is I often am on, I'm always on the side of uh, biotech for kind of the broad underlying capabilities and the algorithms and data science behind a lot of that as well. So I think this would probably fall into the tools for predicting, detecting, and tracking, but a little bit uh, as well on the ability to diagnose and treat. Um, so it's kind of all of it all over the place, but I think that Fundamentally, biology is a data field that's locked in an analog form. So I think that understanding from a digital, from a data standpoint and from a, an, an analytical standpoint is going to unlock a lot of what's going on. So you can use all the you know, different algorithms to predict if people are going to you know, interact with someone who might be infected, if, to predict uh, new vaccine candidates. So I think the underlying computational capabilities in our ability to more accurately model biology in those spaces will impact all of those aspects. I'm sure Andy has an opinion. Well, all of these things, I wouldn't want to have to choose among them. I see them all as part of a system, a system of capabilities that can uh, detect early, uh, even prevent and deter uh, biological threats. So we never again have a pandemic. So we convince our adversaries that pursuing biological weapons would be a waste of time because you won't be effective. But it needs to be, it's very fragmented right now. And these different things ranging from, you know, detection, diagnostics, characterization to rapid countermeasures. And by rapid countermeasures, I mean the sequence was posted by the Chinese lab and within days, we had these platform technologies that could take that data and make a vaccine pronto. This is the system that we need. We need that viral uh, you know, weather underground map so we know where to respond and, and we, we can help uh, uh, make a better response if it's in a country that doesn't have the capabilities that, that some other countries can, can bring to bear. So I, I see it as this global biodefense system that we need to be working towards. Saskia, what's on your wish list? Um, probably, I mean, I agree with Andy, everything would be ideal. <laughs> but something regarding detection, because what I see so much is that it's quite a process from the moment that potentially infectious patient walks into an urgent care or a hospital and an astute physician picks up on something and we do tests on it and send it to the health department. I mean, that is days, if not weeks. So something with a little bit more proactive efforts to identify, you know, using ICD-10 codes or whatever it might be within the electronic medical record. But I'm, I'm concerned that we're so reliant on um, very uh, proactive frontline measures to get this information and to identify weird cases and outbreaks that it's going to take a while for them to be noticed further down the line. So if we had more detection on, on the hospital and urgent care levels that then fed in, I know, you know, we do biosense and that that's very helpful, but I don't see any of that output. So I don't know if there's a weird outbreak going on five miles down the road and a more integrated detection process into the front lines, into our hospitals and our labs that then report it through 
state and county health departments that can respond more quickly would be really helpful because we're very, very reliant on measures we had 50 years ago. Max, any thoughts as a fiction author in terms of what technologies we should develop? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you right now, I'm, I'm the only outsider on this panel, right? I'm the only just regular schmuck. And I can tell you that nothing you've recommended, nothing is going to work without a guaranteed financial incentive. Because this, is, this has been the problem. Uh, 20 years ago in the 1990s, we heard about all these miracle cures, right? These genetic cures. We were going we to map the human genome. We were going to have targeted genetic cures that within, by the year 2000, was going to wipe out cancer, going to wipe out Parkinson's. This is what we were being told. Well, my mother died waiting for one of these cancer cures. And I got two friends with Parkinson's that are still waiting for this cure. You know what we did get? We got a blue pill to make boomer schlongs hard. That was the great polio vaccine of the turn of the century. Why? Because there was a lot of money in that. And if you don't provide from a government standpoint, the kind of financial security, the incentive to invest in this, the same way companies invest in something like the Joint Strike Fighter or any other long-term multi-decade weapons platform, nobody is going to want to invest in that. If you just leave it up to the free market, they will go with whatever is going to turn a profit. So you need to have the federal government who is invested in public goods step forward and say to these brain trusts of corporate America, listen, we need you to work on this. And we promise you, it will be worth it for you in the end. Thanks so much. So the second question we're not going to get to, but I'll just for the audience's um, uh, purpose, I'll, I'll tell them. Uh, what are the most significant barriers for leveraging biotech and AI for future biological incidents? Um, so I think we talked about some of these. Um, the number one is data privacy and other ethical issues, but it's pretty even across the board. Um, dual use issues, 21% um, lack of strong public private partnership limited resources only came in at 18%, but I think we've all established that that is a really critical um, element to doing better next time around. So with that, I will let Christine close things, close things out. Thanks, Natasha, uh, and thank you all. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined us today. I know, including we have frontline workers and experts who are working in our government and uh, private institutions and academia on the COVID fight. So keep up the good work and our thoughts are with you. Um, one question that came across was how to create an affordable moonshot vision for addressing biological threats. Uh, I hope you'll follow our work at uh, the Council on Strategic Risk that we're doing on this uh, on our website uh, and follow us on Twitter at csrisks.com. I hope you'll also join me uh, in checking out Max's forthcoming book out in a few weeks, Devolution. I know I have my copy pre-ordered and can't wait to read it. Uh, looking forward to it. Thank you to all of our panelists and guests today. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.